Beyond the Clef is presented by Director's Choice. Hello and welcome to Beyond the Clef, live at TMEA 2018. I am here with Stacy Dunn. Thanks for being on the program, Stacy. Thank you for inviting me, David. I appreciate it. Yeah, well, now, Stacy, uh, you're best known for your time at Southwest High School in Fort Worth ISD. And uh, right now, though, you are retired. Congratulations on that. Thank Just you. Just recently retired. Thank you. And uh, you are the uh, music, I got to get administrative music specialist in Fort Worth ISD. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm loving it. Cool. We I did 17 years at oh. Southwest High School. And uh, after retiring eight weeks later to the day, started as a music specialist in Fort Worth. And well, so it's a great we, opportunity because I get to help you know, band directors, young band directors, and help them, sure, you know, sure. whatever needs to be done administratively. Because sometimes, you know, we hit walls. Right. Sometimes that teacher, you know, they're in a situation where they're teaching mixed classes, it's on an A, B schedule, they see half the kids on one day, and they need antidotes to make that program amazing. Right. And then once they're there long enough, they become a band institution. And then they get to shape the program. And so, just in a nutshell, I encourage people to stay in a job, stay there long enough where you become the leader of that program and don't run away. Right. You know, make your rainbow. I tell guys this all the time. You know, don't look for the rainbow, make the rainbow. There is, like the grass that. isn't greener on the other side. You, I like you, that. You gotta water the lawn. Well, we were actually talking with uh, Dick Clardy recently about you and what you guys are doing, your whole team, and uh, I really like that what, what you said, make the rainbow, because that's what you've you've done at Southwest yeah. High School, and you seem to really have a passion for that. Can we? I want to talk a little bit about your time uh, here with um, Fort Worth ISD and mentoring uh, teachers and going through that. So tell me a little bit about your duties there, and then also uh, what what you think that. Um, I, how you can implement Make the Rainbow with your with your yeah, current I'd, students. I'd love to share that with you. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, my current students are educators. Right. And so... That's what Barbara Lambrook, we had her on just recently as well, and she amazing. was saying the same thing. Yeah. Oh, I, I've stolen so much from her. I, yeah. I'm going to give her credit right now. Sure. Barbara, God bless you. Thank you. <laughs> she uh, is amazing. And so what what I'm doing in Fort Worth the way I see it is, first of all, I'm, I'm giving guys hope because some of these schools, inner city schools, they're almost feel like they're in hopelessness. I mean, it's they're, they're going to work by themselves. There's no assistant. If it's a brass guy, he's by himself. He's doing woodwind percussion, and it happens all the time in, in our district. And so what I'm trying to do really is utilize staff in a cooperative way, in vertical alignment. And if I could help our administration understand this, we could do so much more. So meaning that rather than being alone with 60 students, imagine the classroom. I mean, we're trying to keep student classroom sizes to 20 for teachers, but we expect the band director to go in there with 60 to 80 and be successful. And what I'm trying to do is say, hey, I got a guy over here that's a woodwind teacher, a guy over here that's a brass teacher. Let's let them cooperate together within their pyramid. And now you go into that band rehearsal with an assistant. And so you're a brass man teaching brass in class, but you got the woodwind guy maybe from the sixth grade going in and helping cooperative teaching. And when they're done, they have a discussion in the office about how they can help each other, what we need to do. And it's encouraging. And when I have a problem, I have someone to share it with. Yes. And we get to come up with antidotes together. And so that's my goal for them, is try to help them to utilize staff in the most effective way possible. Secondly, I like to talk to them about, I, I don't believe you look for the perfect job. Now, I think you can be wise in your choice of where you go. But I also believe you know, a lot of young teachers are out there like looking for the rainbow. You know, I want to find the perfect job. Or, or you, you're in a job and you're, you think the grass is greener on the other side, okay? It isn't. It isn't. You can go to a new job and there, there may be professional conflict. 
maybe someone puts you down in that new job. It's a great spot. And there's all kinds of problems that occur. Uh, so anyway, I like to tell them to make the rainbow. And my number one motto, I have to say this in this podcast, and I've lived by this, and that is, and this is painted on all my band hall walls, results, not excuses. And so I look at, at my kids, and you create, like Barbara says, and like so many other directors say, you're creating this culture of excellence in these programs. So what I'm doing with the people I work with, and I have great people that, that I'm helping, and they're going through a lot of tremendous hardship. And so I'm just saying, hey, results, not excuses. Uh, you know, another antidote, I'm full of these. Is how do you need an elephant? It seems impossible, but one bite at a time. And so we just look at everything, we line it up, what do we need to fix, and let's go at it. And then stay there long enough where you're an institution, where, where Mr. Dunn runs the band program. And you can't expect that in the first nine months. You can't expect that in the first 18 months. It's gonna take you staying there, working hard, them seeing you work hard, overcoming obstacles, making no excuses. And I'm gonna tell you, three, four years in, you'll be the institution of that school. They'll see you're helping kids, and then you get to create the rainbow. And then they're like, well, Mr. Dunn, what do you need us to help you do? And I say, well, what I'd like to do is take, you know, so-and-so from the sixth grade, he's a percussion specialist, float him to the middle school, and then take uh, the middle school band director who's a low brass man and move him down to the sixth grade to do low brass, and so pretty soon, you've got three guys. That's all you have for three schools. But those three guys are working together. That's what I'm trying to do in Fort Worth. That's fantastic. Thank you. That's really great. Well, and, and I, I'm i going to go ahead and start printing off some songs that say results, not excuses for my band on Tuesday when well, we go back after TMA. I, I highly recommend it. It's a great motto. Yeah, yeah it's Cause, really good. Because everything that happens, everything we do, you know, if it's all region, if it's solo and ensemble, if it's a lesson, Mr. Dunn, I can't make it tonight. Hey, dude, come on, man, look at the sign. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, that's fantastic. Promotes a great culture. Now, off camera, we were talking about a little bit of your your start, and uh, you are from Illinois, and you, you had an interesting teacher, Arnold Jacobs, one of the most famous tuba players in history. Tell us a little yeah. bit about that story. Well, it is an incredible story. I look back now and I think, man, you know, I mean, I, uh, it was unique. And the way it all came about, I, I want to say this, none of that would have happened if it were not for a gentleman named Bill Carroll. Uh, all my life, you know, you can line up your greatest mentors, you know, and I, I'm not going to say them because there's so many and I don't want to leave anyone out. Of course. But in this story, I can say, Bill Carroll was one of my great mentors. And Bill, you know, was teaching out here in a small, you know, rural high school in the country. The population of my town was 475. I lived in a farm and... I'm sure you've had bands that have been close to 475 people. <laughs> well, I've had hundreds, yes, hundreds. That's a small town. That's a small town. And so what happened is when I went to high school with Bill, Bill's like, dude, you gotta get out and see the world, man. You're living in a bubble. You know, you're in this little like microcosm and you've gone, where have you gone? Rockford? No, well, that's 13 miles away. And I had never had lessons, no private lessons. And uh, so Bill, he had this program with the boosters where he would sponsor a student. If you raise money in the boosters, he would sponsor that student enough money to go to see the Chicago Symphony. So it was part of his curriculum. He encouraged it. So what happened, um, he would give me the money to get to the train in Harvard. I'd take the train in to see the symphony so I knew where Orchestra Hall was. I knew how to get off the Harvard train and go in and see the symphony. That was my sophomore year. Well, my sophomore year, I went to a summer camp at University of Wisconsin. And I met a tuba player there, incredible tuba player, first chair, and he studied with Arnold Jacobs. And I was like, man, I, 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 it's been my dream. And I'm talking to this kid and 
I mean, it was impossible. He looked at me like, look, forget it, man. You'll never get in. It's never going to happen. Nobody gets in with, with Arnold Jacobs. And uh, so I went home, and that was my sophomore year. Well, you know, time passed. I kept improving, getting better. And my senior year, I thought, man, I want to study with a great tuba player. And so one night I thought, you know what? I'm going to call Arnold Jacobs. I'm going to see if I can't get a hold of him. So I called information. Back then you could get two numbers at a time. And if you went to your third number, it was 50 cents. I didn't want dad to know I was doing this. <laughs> so I called the first two. So I said, ma'am, can I get the first two Arnold Jacobs in the Chicago phone book? And so I got them and I called them and they both said, no, I'm sorry, this is not Arnold Jacobs for the Chicago Symphony. So then I ca called information again. I got number three and four. Called both of them, no. Called information again, got five and six. Well, I got called number five, and I said, uh, hello, is this the residence of Arnold Jacobs with the Chicago Symphony? And a lady answered, why, yes, it is. She said, uh, uh, yes, uh, my husband plays with the symphony. I said, well, could I talk to Mr. Jacobs, please? And she said, well, yes, you can, one moment, please. <laughs> I was blown away. The fact that I got their house and it was that easy to talk to Arnold Jacobs. Wow. So I get Arnold on the phone. I said, hello, Mr. Jacobs, this is Stacy Dunn. Uh, I live in Poplar Grove, Illinois. I'm 100 miles from Chicago. And I want to take lessons from the best tuba player in the world. And I remember that's exactly what I said. I said, sir, you're the best tuba player in the world and it'd be a dream for me to take lessons from you. And he says, well, son, you're a long ways from Chicago. And he said, uh, plus I'm very busy. I'm just getting ready to go on tour. He said, I'll tell you what, I've got a very dear friend. He plays second tuba with the symphony. His name's Clyde Bashan. And he lives in Beloit, Wisconsin which is 15 miles from you. And he said, why don't you study with him? I'll give you his number. So I called up Clyde Bashan, wonderful man, great tuba player. I studied with him. I did my audition in college with his training, got accepted at Vandercook College of Music. And six months to the day, I call Mr. Jacobs back. I said, hello, Mr. Jacobs, this is Stacy Dunn. I said, sir, you remember me? You told me to call back after you got off tour and you gone six months, I said, sir, I want to take lessons from you. You're the best tuba player in the world and I want to study from you. And he says, well, son, uh, you know, I am really busy. My, my schedule's completely full. He said, uh, you know, why don't you call me back in a couple weeks? So two weeks later, I call him again. I says, hello, Mr. Jacobs. This is Stacy Dunn again, sir. He says, he says, son, you are the most persistent young man I have ever talked to. I mean, you just don't give up, do you? <laughs> I says, well, no, sir. He says, well, can you come in tomorrow at 10 a.m.? And this was a Friday night I called him. I says, yes, sir, I'll be there. And he says, all right, well, I'll see you at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Well, I was lost now. I don't know. I knew he taught, you know, in the Fine Arts Building next to Orchestra Hall. That's all I knew. So, uh, Your parents at the Art Institute. About this? No, no, they didn't know anything, <laughs> no. And they didn't know I went for my lesson, my oh, first man. lesson. So I drove my car to Harvard, I got on the train with my tuba, uh, went in there, got off on Michigan Avenue, find, found the Fine Arts Institute, looked for Arnold Jacobs, and I got there up to his room, and this guy comes out in a parka with a French horn, and uh, he's from Austria, and he <laughs> says, uh, you know, I, 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 and he had a like a mocha in his hand, leaving the room and I open the door and there's tubas, 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 you know, TV screen, that microphone to, to analyze your sound, uh, breathing machine, see how many liters of air your lungs hold. And I walked in and it was just like, you know, to me, uh, a part of, of, wow, this is my first lesson with the best tuba player I know in the world. and. So I go in, we sit down, we have a lesson, and from that day on, I mean, I could call him Friday night and get a lesson Saturday. It was enough, it was, it was it. Wow. So, and I, I kept, continued to my lessons. It was wonderful. Now I went in playing on a B-flat tuba. Um, I do want to tell, tell you this, is it is interesting. I, uh, in my lessons, 
I never forget this. My first lesson, imagine if you want to know how green I was. Now, I, I could play, I had an ear, I could hear. And so when he talked wind and song, oh my gosh, I was just like, that's it. No one ever said wind and song. So, you know, you blow the wind and then you produce the song. It was always about how to play. How do I play my instrument? And uh, so, you know, Jake was very explicit in saying that the instrument is just a microphone of what you actually hear. And he was a master at solfege. In my first lesson, he solfeged my solo. And I was like, what the heck? So he had perfect pitch, of course. So he's like, you know, do, sol, do, mi, re, do, ti, do, ti, do, re, la, re, fa, mi, re, di, re, mi, fa, sol, la, fa, sol, mi, re, do, fa, mi, mi, re, re, do, sol, do. And he would do his solfege in style. Wow. That's fantastic. So I became a student of solfeggio, okay. big time. I use it in my class. I use it with my students. I call it a vocal play. So I have the students sing like do, 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 and release on four, horn, play. So I'm trying to get the brain to cross out of the feel and move into the song. Okay. Right? And that's when my life changed musically. So now notes were no longer valves, notes were no longer um, instrument, notes were no longer the mouthpiece. The, the, all it is is the music, all it is is the sound. And so that's how you, you are sitting there with your tuba and you play you know, a high E above the staff and you just play it because you hear the note and you're not trying to play tight or loose or whatever. So that's where Jake was incredible. And also with how many leaders you're getting, learning on expanding your lungs. And then of course, the first electronics I'd ever seen was the, this TV screen that when you would perform would show as you play if you were stopping the air or if you had fluidity because the fluidness is critical. That's so important to, to accuracy. Anyway. So I got to do all these lessons and finally the day came. He's like, Stacy, look, you've really advanced. I did try out for the Civic Orchestra of Chicago. And uh, my third time, I made it. <laughs> so, and it was fascinating. I mean, you know, um, but he said, Stacy, you need to get a C tuba. So uh, in my one of my lessons, he says, Stacy, listen, Fred Geib's wife called me. She's trying to sell Fred's tuba. Uh, from New York, and he said it's a great con CJ5, four valves here, uh, one in the left hand, and he said uh, it'd be a great choice for you. It's an amazing tuba. So I went home, you know, from the lesson, got the money together, got ready to go in for my lesson, and then Friday night, Jake calls me at home, and he says, Stacy, he said, I know you're coming in for your lesson tomorrow to get your tuba but he said, I want to talk to you about something. He said, a very, very dear friend of Fred's who studied under Fred Guy has called me and asked to purchase the tuba. It's very important to him. And every fiber in my 17 year old body said no. But I thought, wow, you know, if this were Jake's tuba and, and I want, you know, this opportunity, I would have to let him have it. And so I told Jake, let him buy it. And so the next morning I went in for my lesson, 10 o'clock. I'm sure I look like a little sad little puppy dog. Had my B-flat Minel Wesson. And 10 minutes in my lesson, he reaches over, grabs his Rudolph Minel, and he says, here, Stacy, play this. And so that's the first time I played on a C-tube. It was Jake's C. And I played through my lesson with the C-tube. It was unbelievable. This horn was amazing. And in the end of the lesson, Jake looks at me and says, you know, I feel so bad about Fred. You know, if you want, I'll let you buy this tuba. <laughs> and so uh, next time I came back, I brought the money in and I bought the tuba and I owned that tuba for 26 or 28 years, excuse me, 28 years I owned that tuba. 
And then I finally sold it about, I want to say 10 years ago. And then I bought Matt Good's tuba with the Dallas Symphony. And he, that's a Hirschbrunner. So, and I love the Hirschbrunner I'm on. It's a 1985 made by Peter Hirschbrunner. I love the passing the torch symbolism in the tuba world with these tubas, these, these really uh, cool. they're tools, but they're so special. And the young man that bought it from me, I put it on TubeNet. I had hundreds of emails within three hours. And there was a young man in Texas that was going into music and he brought with him Arnold's book, Win Song and Wind. And uh, I knew when this young man played the tuba, he just loved Mr. Jacobs. And I thought, man, this is where it's got to go. So I didn't try to make a lot of money. And I gave the young man my receipt. Because <laughs> I, I had Arnold's signature on the receipt for the tube I bought. And I, pre I presented it to the young man. And I'm sure he's out teaching now or, or playing professionally somewhere. That's great. And that's a historical piece. It is. That, so that's really yeah, great. It was a privilege for me to own it for that long. Sure. Other lessons from your lessons with Arnold Jacobs. What, what else, what other gems? Well, in my first lesson, this was shocking. Um, Arnold looked at me and says, listen, Stacy, when you take a deep breath, which way does your stomach go? I said, in. I mean, can you believe that? I'm right. like 17. Right. I still thought my stomach went in when I filled my lungs with air. And he says, Stacy, think about it. He says, you're taking in air. They're, he says, think about your lungs as two large balloons. He said, which way should your stomach go when you take in air? And I looked at him and I said, out. Oh. He said, exactly. So we proceeded to have my first lesson, and mine was so rigid. I had, I had you know, done it wrong for so many years. I couldn't take a breath and have my stomach go out. So he had me just do practice. Controlling the muscle, literally, without breathing. And I did that, you know, you know, five, six times a day, do it 20 times. And then my next lesson I came in, so that was profound. And then, okay, then we talk about the lungs, the shape of the lungs, the very tips of the lungs. You, you're just amazed to find out how many more liters of air you can get when the diaphragm drops and the bottom tips of your lungs are full. So that was profound. And then also he taught to not play in the lower, like almost almost half, but he says never get to the lower third of your lung capacity. Because there your body is screaming blow, blow, blow. But if you're full of air, your body is saying blow, the subconscious. Does that make sense, David? Yes. So being a low brass man, if I'm full of air, you know, chest expanded. So yes, does the chest move on a low brassman? Yes, it does. Do the shoulders? No. But he said the chest moves. This can expand. This drops and expands. Everything expands. And then the lungs can produce larger quantities of air. So that was an incredible lesson. And so we, we delved into that in the beginning the most, just getting the most capacity, lung capacity out of my lungs. You know, Jake only had one lung. Really? Yes. I, 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 I guess I assumed everyone knew that, but no, he had one functioning lung. Wow. And now he, I still had a small piece, I guess, but he had uh, pneum, um, pneumonia as a child and lost that lung. So all his air came from one lung that was massive. Over time, his lung had grown so large, it filled such a large cavity in his body. So that was a, a, you know, amazing that we covered that and that really helped me. Uh, the other thing is self edging. You know, he'd have you self edge in your lesson. That was embarrassing. Yeah. So whenever I would bring in music, I would practice the music with, you know, and have it down, you know, to try to impress him. <laughs> and, uh, and then, uh, you know, we would play together. And, and of course it's all, it was at that point, at that high level, I was pretty good. Like. Even as a senior, uh, Daniel Parentoni had a quintet uh, contest in the state of, tech of Illinois where he built quintets and all the tubas that went, you were placed in order, first, second, third, fourth, fifth. Well, 
when I auditioned for that as a senior, I got first chair. So I was in Daniel Parentoni's brass quintet down at University of Illinois. So it wasn't like I couldn't play. I understood song, I had an ear, but I didn't have that ear. That man, I'm telling you, could solfege anything, anything you put in front of him. So, uh, so that's what was profound is understanding that music is produced. Um, let me say it like this. Sight reading is not the performance of a new song. Sight reading is looking at the music and hearing it already and performing it in your head. And then the performance is just a byproduct of the music you've already played. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So I'm sight writing reading, that down. <laughs> sight reading is not the activity of playing the music, a new piece of music. Sight reading is like like Jake, he'd say, here, look at that. Well, when he said, look at that, look at that means, go ahead, play that. You're already playing. Um, oh, okay, yeah. So then when you play, the, 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 the sight reading is the second performance. <laughs> the act of performing. Wow, that's yeah, pretty profound. It is amazing. And so all these things over time and lessons and that. And then after Jake, I also studied, I want to say this, with Roger Rocco, who was a student of Arnold Jacobs, a very dear friend of mine. I, really, I need to call him and talk to him more, but I learned so much from Roger. And Roger was just a, a you know, an extension of Arnold Jacobs. Exactly the same. So. so many fantastic gems. I've written a half a page of notes here and for myself, and I've learned so much about Arnold Jacobs. Thank you for sharing that with us today. Thank you. And sharing your uh, knowledge about uh, in your experience and your mentorship that you're doing right now in Fort Worth ISD and, and from your time at Southwest. Yeah, the, uh, the mentorship, it's so fun, you know, change. Is, is renewing you know change is renewing like when I went to Southwest my first two years at Southwest I actually was the woodwind teacher so I didn't I didn't tell the kids if they ever see this they'll remember this I told them that I was a all-state based clarinetist <laughs> and I worked up three lines of the all-state clarinet I bought an E11 I practiced all summer and I just did three lines of it, and I played the heck out of it. And that was the only time I played for the Woodwinds was those three lines. And from that day on, they listened to everything I told them at Southwest. And so for two years, I taught Woodwinds. I had two all-state all clarinet, Region 5, in my second year at Southwest. And then my third year, uh, I hired William Owens. So Willie... And I are dear friends. Willie and I pledged a fraternity together at Vandercook, and we went back to the very beginnings. And Willie's taught with me a couple times. Amazing man, full of energy. And then he took over Woodwinds, and then I remember announcing to the band that really, I'm a tuba player. <laughs> <laughs> you should have seen all the Woodwinds like I was a traitor. So, but now I said that change is good. I say change is good because after 17 years, I taught woodwinds, and it was inspiring. I, I had a blast. It was like brand new band director. And then I taught 17 years at Southwest, and then this opportun opportunity came about, uh, again, because of an amazing man, Dick Clardy. You know, Dick has come into Fort Worth like a storm, and the needs were so intense and uh, as he when he arrived you know this music specialist idea that he's created that he's really really moved into you know we have Jolette Wine um, we have Scott Taylor we have Gordon Hart and we have Stacy Dunn so these four individuals personally go around on a weekly basis to help mentor listen to advise these people and that strategy that Dick's put in place is incredible and you know Dick uh, first time I heard Dick Clardy's band he says I always make this story bigger than it is 
I am not exaggerating. <laughs> 1998 South Coast Band Festival. I was recording. I used to record, um, you know, around South Texas. But I came up here. I got to hear Scott Taylor's band. I got to hear Dick Clardy's band. They both blew me away. I was always stealing ideas. Scott Taylor, I was close enough right on stage, and I saw he had plexiglass behind his horns. I thought that little stinker. <laughs> no wonder his horns sound incredible. <laughs> so you know, I'm, I'm th I, I started doing that in Brownsville. And then I saw Dick Clardy, and it just blew me away that year. And I, I took the recording home. I said, look, I, I got Honor Man right here. And sure enough, Dick Clardy, Honor Man, you know, 6A in the state of Texas. And when I heard his band, he had this strange setup. And this is where he says I embellish. No embellishment. He had the weirdest setup I've ever seen. And I'm contemplating in this thing. It was amazing. I'm thinking... I wonder if I should use this. Well, and I didn't. But this is what he has up there. It's like uh, two oboes, two bassoons, two trumpets, uh, two trombones, two clarinets. And I'm like, what is, is it some special piece? No, he played the whole concert like that. And so years, years later, this is like three years ago, I look at him and say, look, tell me about the setup. Why, where'd you get that? He says, oh, he says, that was just a, extra little concert I did for the kids so the All-Staters could be recognized. Dude, I'm like, the whole front row is All-Staters. Wow. Now, now, he'll say to me now, he's like, no, 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 but that's Dick. Yeah. He, you know, he's a master organizer, a great man to work for, and, and demanding. You know, he's a results, not excuses man. So I highly respect all of my colleagues and, and am grateful that, that Dick is there. Well, thank you so much for being on the program. We really appreciate it. Thank you, David. Yeah. Uh, appreciate Stacey it. Stacey Dunn, and thanks for joining us on Beyond the Clef.